So it's a privilege to be speaking before the Italian Buddhist Union, and especially in the midst of such outstanding scholars and scientists. So I'll turn right to the topic that I'd like to address, and that is contemplative and scientific ways of knowing. And since I am speaking to the Italian Buddhist Union, I will confine my comments to Buddhist contemplative ways of knowing, and also because that's where been the focus of my studies, my practice, writing, translating, and teaching for the last 50 years. So this will be Buddhist contemplative and scientific ways of knowing. And for context, I'd like to turn to a very brief overview of the evolution of modern science, tracing back to Galileo, who is widely regarded as the founder of modern science. He met stiff resistance, as we all know, from those adhering tenaciously to the scholastic worldview, but by rigorously observing physical, celestial, and terrestrial phenomena, he launched a revolution in the physical sciences. He did so by finding the appropriate technology for the celestial phenomena, of course, that was the telescope, for terrestrial phenomena, he developed his own technologies to determine, for example, that balls rolling down a ramp accelerated and did not go at constant velocity. So he found the appropriate technologies. He rigorously and with great sophistication observed directly the phenomena he was seeking to understand. And he, as a physicist, brilliantly applied mathematical analysis to drawing conclusion. So this was the first revolution in Western science, the physical sciences, after which we can no longer look at the earth and its relationship to other celestial phenomena in the same way. About 250 years later, we have the second great revolution in Western science. This is the revolution in the life sciences. Charles Darwin, again, the common denominator is rigorously observing the phenomena he was seeking to understand. So he wasn't conducting experiments, made no great use of mathematics, but through his careful observation, he formulated his brilliant theory, which has tremendous explanatory power. And of course, we can no longer look at human life and our relationship with the rest of life on this earth in the same way once we've understood and appreciated his great theory. We move forward only a matter of a few decades to the closing decades of the 19th century when the scientific study of the mind began. It began with great phenomenologists such as William James, Wilhelm Wundt, Edward Titchener, and William James proposed to rigorously observe mental phenomena. His proposal was thwarted by the ideology of physicalism, thus delaying, I'm, I would argue, a revolution in the mind sciences, because physicalism was drawing on the strength of science for the last 300 years, observing only the objective, physical, and quantifiable, the problem with the mind is it's not physical, objective, or quantifiable. And by the early decades of the 20th century, behaviorism supplanted the emphasis on introspection, direct observation, first-person observation of mental phenomena, and went back to the approach of the physical sciences and insisted on studying behavior and reduced mind to a mere disposition for behavior. So this revolution that could have happened didn't while darwin had to battle biblical dogmatism william james and his cohorts had to battle the dogmatism both ideological and methodological of physicalism and so there was no revolution in the mind sciences to this day this has led to a blind spot in the physicalist vision of reality as a whole that is so much is known using the time-tested methods of modern science in terms of physics, biology, chemistry, and many other branches of science. But it's widely acknowledged among philosophers and mind scientists that consciousness remains a mystery, a mystery for them. And that is to this day, there's no scientific definition of consciousness. There are no objective means of detecting consciousness or any mental phenomenon. There's ignorance of the neurocorrelates of mental consciousness, ignorance of the necessary and sufficient causes of consciousness, and ignorance of how the brain generates or even influences mental phenomena. So this is very broad sweeping ignorance or unawareness, and there's a very good reason for that. And that is, generally speaking, the mind scientists are assuming that the mind-body relationship has already been solved. They're assuming 
that the mind is that mind consciousness is physical, even though there's no supporting evidence and increasingly compelling evidence that it is not. And so how does consciousness arise? Well, the mind scientists by and large assume they already know. And the mystery is how does the brain generate consciousness? But the great biologist, Thomas H. Huxley, a, a contemporary of Darwin, a great ch champion of Darwin's theory, wrote, how is it that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the jinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. So in his early days, Thomas Huxley was quite an ardent materialist. In fact, one could say he founded the church of scientific materialism, turning science into an all-encompassing worldview and in battle with all the tradition, traditional religions. He was confident that con consciousness could be understood purely biologically. But as the years went by, his faith in his own church, in the unique truth of scientific materialism, that science alone could solve all the problems of nature. It waned and it became more and more critical. And then he looked at this notion that simply by stimulating neurons, we'd say nowadays, that consciousness somehow pops out of the brain like a genie out of a lamp. This is a magical thinking. He recognized this. This is not science. There is no branch of physics that allows for a physical phenomenon to emerge as an emergent property of physical phenomena. It's utterly rootless in terms of physics. There's no justification for it. So the contemporary neuroscientist Donald Hoffman, he comments with respect to this statement from Thomas Huxley. Now Huxley knew that brain activity and conscious experiences are correlated, but he didn't know why. To the science of his day, it was mystery. In the years since Huxley, and now this is about 150 years, science has learned a lot about brain activity, but the relationship between brain activity and conscious experience is still a mystery. I would say it's as much, as, um, as, much a mystery as it was 150 years ago, as much a mystery as when, the, as when the scientific study of the mind began. And yet, if we read the literature, both in the popular media as well as scientific literature, it's quite clear that the great majority of mind scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, are acting as if the relationship of the mind and body has already been solved. Neuroscience in the, began in the 1960s with a leap of faith. Let us simply assume that the mind is nothing more than a biological function of the brain. And now let's see if we can prove it. Well, you know that's not legitimate science. You don't start with a metaphysical principle and then aim your research to prove what you already believe. That is not open-mindedness, that is a commitment to dogma that overrides experience. And historically, the greatest obstacle to discovery has not been ignorance. It's been the illusion of knowledge. And there's an illusion of knowledge right now that the mind and all of its function, consciousness, consists of nothing more than functions or emergent properties of the brain. There was a similar confidence in the latter part of the 19th century among physicists, the utter conviction that the luminiferous ether had to exist. There must be some medium that permeates space, which is the medium by which electromagnetic waves could be propagated. This was disproven quite decisively in 1887 by the famous Michelson-Morley experiment with negative results but even they didn't trust their results because they couldn't imagine how light could propagate through space if there's no medium to carry the waves. Four years after Michaels and Morley disproved the existence of the luminiferous ether, Lord Kelvin, the great physicist, said, of this we are sure, we are sure, we are utterly sure of this, and that is the reality and substantiality of the luminiferous ether, four years after it had been disproved. And physicists continue to believe it because they couldn't imagine a world that was not one of mechanistic materialism where causal causality always entails things bumping into each other. They didn't abandon the, their assumptions about the luminous ether until Einstein's theory, special theory, general relativity, supplanted entirely, backed by empirical evidence. And in 1938, Einstein wrote all assumptions regarding the ether led 
nowhere. I would say similarly, all assumptions about the mind being physical, consciousness being physical, it being generated by the brain, there being only physical influences on the brain, they are all leading nowhere. When we make this practical, all of us, humans and non-humans alike, wish to be free of distress, mental distress, very much so. We're all seeking happiness. But the inner causes of mental distress, the inner causes of genuine well-being, remain largely unknown, again, because of the methodological constraints of physicalism that insists that the causes of our distress are outside. It's our upbringing, it's social, it's interpersonal, it's brain, it's serotonin, it's dopamine, it's genetics. It's got to be outside. And likewise, the causes of happiness. Look outside, look outside to the physical. And what do we have as a result of this myopia? is depression is now the number one cause of disability worldwide, despite the plethora of antidepressants, which are presented as if they were medicine, but they're only suppressing the symptoms, the symptoms of mental disease and the mental diseases themselves or the inner causes of mental diseases are commonly conflated. So when you give a patient an antidepressant, you tell them that's medication. It's not, it, it's anesthesia. And in fact, there's not one psychopharmacological drug, not one pharmaceutical drug pertaining to the mind that heals, that cures any mental disease. They're all just forms of anesthesia. The risk of depression is 32% higher in wealthy countries, where one might expect, of course, given the outer conditions, it would be less. And the United States gross domestic product has decreased 50 times since 1950. Well, the World Health Organization says the change in well-being has been zero and depression has increased 10 times. So this would suggest a profound ignorance of what are the actual causes of mental distress? And what are the actual causes of genuine well-being? Then we turn to the external world, the world that we widely assume to be out there existing, independent of consciousness, independent of mind, purely physical, inherently objectively existent, consisting of matter and energy. Well, look at some of the comments by some of the greatest physicists in the, in the history of physics over the last hundred years. Max Planck, the founder of quantum mechanics, writes, as a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about atoms this much. There is no matter as such. It's a phenomenal statement. Steven Weinberg, a contemporary Nobel, Nobel Prize winning physicist, he writes, in the physicist's recipe for the world, the list of ingredients no longer includes particles. Matter thus loses its central role in physics. All that is left are principles of symmetry, which are abstractions, which are conceptual constructs. According to current cosmology, very widely known, the universe's energy consists of 5% normal matter. That's what we can actually observe. 25% dark matter and 70% dark energy, which are unobservable, unknown, frankly, that's why they're called dark. So most of the energy in the world remains unknown because nobody can see it. They just see the effects of dark matter. There's more coherence in the universe than can be understood in terms of normal matter. And the universe is expanding, the rate of acceleration of the universe expanding at an accelerating rate. But there's no explanation for that apart from energy in the physical world. And therefore they attribute it to an unknown type of energy. But are these even really caused by matter and energy. We don't know because physicists have been assuming for hundreds of years now, the only influences on the physical universe are physical. So it all boils down to energy. And then we turn to one more great Nobel Prize winning physicist, Richard Feynman. And he writes, it is important to realize that in physics today, we have no knowledge of what energy is. 
We know an enormous amount about the conservation of energy, different types of energy, how energy transforms a matter, matter into energy. But what is energy that is being conserved? And he says, we have no knowledge. So for the physicalist, it's the physicists who are pulling the rug out from what they consider to be the ultimate, ultimate nature of reality, from which everything else emerges, including mind and consciousness. The problem now is that especially quantum mechanics, as it advances, the primacy of matter, the primacy of elementary particles, the primacy, the objective reality of energy is slipping away very fast. Physicists are undermining physicalism. And now the nature of the physical universe as it exists out there, physicist Carlo Rovelli celebrates the great successes of quantum theory by commenting, quantum theory has clarified the foundations of chemistry, the functioning of atoms, of solids, of plasmas, of the color of the sky, the dynamics of the stars, the origins of the galaxies, a thousand aspects of the world, something to be celebrated a terrifically successful theory about the nature of the physical universe. It is at the basis of the latest technologies, from computers to nuclear power. This is the all-pervasive and tremendously influential role of quantum theory in understanding the physical universe. But then Richard Feynman again comments, and he's quoted to this day by very, very knowledgeable physicists, when he writes, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. They know what's not true now. Absolute space, absolute time, elementary particles existing in and of themselves, independent of the act of measurement. They know what's not true. But what does quantum mechanics actually tell us about the physical world out there? On this, there's no consensus, a wide variety of interpretations of quantum mechanics, but no consensus. And that's because, as he says, nobody understands quantum mechanics. And finally, what I could regard as the, the death blow is by a leading physicist at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, brilliant, tremendously respected by his peers, the physicist Nima Khani Ahmed. And he commented recently at a large conference at Cornell University with about 300 physicists in attendance, he said many, many separate arguments, all very strong individually, suggest that the very nature of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There is no such thing as space-time, fundamentally, in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics. That's very startling. Because what physics is supposed to be about is describing things as they happen in space and time. So if there is no space time, it's not clear what physics is about. That's why this is a hard problem. And that's a serious comment. In terms of an inherent existent objective universe, physical out there, he's just taken away the container. And not just he alone, but many separate arguments, each one very compelling. So is there a universe out there, objectively inherently real? And if so, is it even physical? This too remains a hard problem. And he says, this is a serious comment. This looks like another re revolution is in the offing with respect to physics. But there are great advances in modern physics as well. So here are a few leading physicists all of them contemporary. Physicist Thomas Hertog, a protege of Stephen Hawking, he writes, you can think of the, that quantum reality a bit like a tree. The branches represent all possible universes. And our observations, we are part of the universe, so we are part of that tree. Our observations select certain branches and hereby give meaning or give reality to our past in a quantum world. Quantum theory states we may not be mere chemical scum. Life and the cosmos are, in the quantum theory, a synthesis, and our observations now give, in fact, reality to its earliest days. 
Stephen Hawking wrote a paper with Thomas Hertog commenting, everything we know about the past is based on observations made in the present. But prior to an observation, prior to the act of measurement, what exists in the path is in a superposition state, which is sheer potential. There is no one real past to the universe. Multiple universes rising relative to multiple questions and systems of measurement. One of the leading physicists today, I think one of the most brilliant interpreters of quantum mechanics is Professor Christopher Fuchs at the University of Massachusetts in Boston formulating an interpretation of quantum mechanics called cubism. And he said, treat this system, his interpretation treats the wave function, the quantum mechanical wave function, as a description of a single observer's subjective knowledge. It resolves all the quantum paradoxes, but at the not insignificant cost of anything we might call reality, something really existing out there. For example, a single objective reality is, well, that is to say, a single objective reality is an illusion. And its groundbreaking theory abandons the tradition rooted or traced back to the ancient Greeks of thinking about the world in purely objective terms without the involvement of a knowing subject. He writes, cubism goes against that grain by saying that quantum mechanic is not about how the world is without us. Instead, it's precisely about us in the world. The subject, of the, of the subject matter of the theory is not the world or us, but us within the world, the interface between the two. And Amanda Gefter was a very, very excellent science writer she comments on Christopher Fuchs' theory, writing, so while neuroscientists struggle to understand how there can be such a thing as a first-person reality, nature of consciousness, how can the brain generate the mind, quantum physicists have to grapple with the mystery of how there can be anything but a first-person reality. These are tremendous advances to my mind. But the problem is that in all of one's education as a physicist, from elementary school to doing postdoctoral work, you're not given any methods for exploring the mind, the nature of the observer, the nature of consciousness. So they are not trained to fathom the nature of first person experience, the mind, the act of observation. It's an incomplete theory and the mind scientists aren't helping them. And there's a good reason for this. We go back to Donald Hoffman, a very revolutionary neuroscientist who has the courage to challenge the orthodoxy, the church of scientific materialism that manifests in the mind sciences and specifically in neuroscience. He says, not only are neuroscientists ignoring the progress in fundamental physics, they're often explicit about it. They'll say quite openly that quantum physics is not relevant to the aspects of brain function that are causally involved in consciousness. They're certain that it's got to be the classical properties of neural activity, which exists independent of any observers, spiking rates, connection strengths at synapses, per perhaps dynamical properties as well. These are all very classical notions under Newtonian physics, where time is absolute and objects exist absolutely. But of course, all of this is antiquated. All of this is a dinosaur. It died in the 19th century, early 20th century. So neuroscientists are still living in the 19th century in terms of physics. And then they, he writes, are mystified as to why they don't make progress. Because the physics in which their beliefs and, I, and methodologies are rooted has been completely discredited by 20th and 21st century science. He continues, they don't avail themselves of the incredible insights and breakthroughs that physics has made. Those insights are out there for us to use. And yet my field says, we'll stick with Newton, thank you. We'll stay 300 years behind in our physics. And I think he's put his finger on the reason why. There's been no real advances in understanding consciousness or the actual nature 
of how the brain influences the mind, how the mind influences the brain. So there's a great disparity here between physics and psychology, and this has not gone unnoticed by His Holiness Dalai Lama, who has been actively involved, rigorously, open-mindedly involved in, di in dialogues with scientists, certainly going back to 1987, when the Mind and Life Institute was founded, but even back to 1973, when he first came to Europe and met with some of the leading physicists of that day. And he commented recently, in my recent conversation with scientists, I found that they have conducted excellent investigations into the nature of the objective physical world, but the Western science of psychology is at a primitive level. They're not able to distinguish between the sensory modes of consciousness and the mind or mental consciousness. Neuroscientists who present sophisticated explanations of the brain say that the many kinds of conceptualization of the mind are all functions of specific parts of the brain. So contemporary psychology is not up to the task. In general, classical Indian academia's emphasis on nonviolence and compassion is related to the mind. About 2000 years ago, single-pointed shamatha and vipassana, which I will discuss later, single-pointed shamatha and vipassana, contemplative technology and contemplative science were used to develop discerning intelligence. Nowadays, the physical sciences are quite good, unlike the mind sciences. These are not religious matters, but academic topics for the sake of increasing our knowledge. And Buddhist texts are an excellent resource from which scientists could greatly benefit. So we turn now, turn the corner to Buddhist contemplative science. And of course, contemplative science predated the life, the discoveries, the impact on Asian culture of the Buddha some 2,600 years ago. Indian truth seekers called Shramanas, as long as 5,000 years ago, there's evidence, indirect evidence, that they had learned to develop stable, highly focused attention, samadhi, as the indispensable means for probing the nature of the mind and its role in the natural world. I would argue that as tel the telescope is absolutely indispensable for observing and fathoming the nature of the sun, moon, planets, stars, galaxies, by direct observation of these celestial phenomena, so is samadhi, highly focused, concentrated, unified concentration. Turn inwards upon the nature of the activities of the mind, the nature of consciousness itself, the origins of consciousness, how consciousness interfaces with the body and what happens at death. And more broadly speaking, what is the role of mind? What is the role of consciousness in the natural world? They found the right technology thousands of years ago. Gautama then, Gautama the, the Buddha, he stood on the shoulders of giants. As Newton said, he stood on the shoulders of giants, which enabled him to see further on the shoulders of people like Kepler and Galileo. Gautama's first venture into the contemplative life after leaving his home was to train under two extraordinarily accomplished masters of samadhi. That was his first step, to draw from the contemplative technology of centuries of yogis, swamis, rishis, who preceded him, who had made tremendous discoveries before he came along with the power of samadhi. He refined voluntary attention and then used the enhanced stability and vividness of attention, which is cultivated through the practices of shamatha, and used it use shamati in unprecedented ways to explore states of consciousness and their objects. And this is done with the array of methods of inquiry, empirical, rational, first person inquiry, not just into the behavioral expressions of consciousness, is what behaviors do, not just into the neurochoral of the consciousness, which neuroscientists are very good at doing, without parallel, but the nature of the phenomenon, it's the phenomenon itself, mind, the nature of consciousness, shamatha and vipassana, he said, this is the key. This is the technology and these are the modes of 
contemplative scientific inquiry that gives rise to discoveries that can be replicated, have been replicated, replicated for hundreds of years. In short, he commented, the mind that is established in equipoise, meditative equipoise, relaxed, stable, clear, with the attention focused, unwavering, and then imbued with Vipassana, comes to know reality as it is from the inside out. Whereas Western science to this day has sought to understand the whole of reality from the outside in. And therefore virtually all the money, all the press, all the prestige, all the influence for studying the mind goes to people who are studying the brain and behavior, trying to understand the mind from the outside in. But we see has not been much of a success. A crucial distinction here, which was known by the ancient Greeks, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, is a distinction between two types of happiness known very explicitly in Buddhism and in other contemplative and philosophical and scientific traditions as well, that is namely positive psychology. The difference between hedonia, all kinds of pleasure that we experience in response to pleasant stimuli, including chemical in, in the brain, alcohol, drugs, what have you, as well as sensory, as well as intellectual and aesthetic stimuli, which are fleeting, come and go, and never, never provide satisfaction, in contrast to what the Greeks called hedonia, genuine well-being. You pursue hedonia, but you cultivate eudomonia or genuine well-being. And the Buddha laid out a very clear path. How do you cultivate genuine well-being? And what are the multiple dimensions of satsuka, sublime well-being, samyaksuka, genuine well-being? The first dimension, the entry level, is the well-being arising from a clear conscience and contentment. A clear conscience is not clear because you have no conscience. It's a clear conscience because you have a high degree of ethical intelligence. You know the fundamental principles of Buddhist ethics, namely nonviolence and benevolence. And you review your conduct, your way of engaging with the world. And you see you are living in accordance with those principles of nonviolence and benevolence. And your conscience is clear. And in terms of hedonia, which can be acquired by, the, by means of acquiring wealth, power, reputation, fame, having contentment, being satisfied with enough, and not always striving for more wealth, more influence, more fame, drinking salt water until you die of thirst. The first dimension. The second dimension is a deeper, more sustainable sense of well-being that is gained through the cultivation of mental balance, exceptional mental balance and the unification of the mind, namely samadhi. There are multiple aspects of mental balance, cognitive, ethical, attentional, cognitive, emotional, and spiritual. So it's cultivating overall exceptional mental health and well-being, which makes your mind then a suitable vessel for using it to explore the very nature of reality itself. And it's through the practice of Vipassana above all that one may come to the supreme well-being, the well-being that comes through the wisdom of knowing reality as it is, and that is through the cultivation of wisdom or prajna. There's a template for the causes of genuine well-being, the likes of which Modern science, including positive psychology, is just barely scratching the surface. Here's a very dense slide, but I want to contextualize this just a little bit. We in the West tend to think of Buddhism as a religion. We classify it so with a kind of linguistic colonialism, as if anything taking place in another culture like that of India must fit into our conceptual boxes. We see signs of Buddhist monks and so forth. Oh, it's a religion. That fundamentally discredits it as a religion. That is the very notion of religious discoveries hardly comes up in the West. Some with knowledge beliefs like Professor Jay Garfield recognize there's authentic philosophy. Others, including myself, there's 
There is Buddhist religion. There is Buddhist philosophy. There's also Buddhist science. But there's also something, a great secret, hidden in plain sight. And that is during the first millennium of the common era, there developed a vast, intricate, sophisticated, rigorous network of universities. They were not just monasteries or seminaries. They were universities, some rooted in the Vedic tradition, in the Upanishads, Theravada Buddhism, Jainism, the Yoga tradition, Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism. They all had spiritual roots, but they were not just promoting their own religion. At great Buddhist centers like Nalanda, they studied all the different philosophical traditions. So these were, this was a whole network of universities throughout India, where in the primary focus, most explicitly in Buddhism, the primary focus of their inquiry was the nature of mind, nature of consciousness, nature of genuine well-being understanding the role of mind in nature. And they had not only brilliant logicians like Dignaga and Dharmakirti in the Buddhist tradition, but they also had the whole experimental branch of the study of mind and its role in nature. And that was the tradition of meditation. The great siddhas, the great yogis in the Buddhist tradition, these were the experimentalists like Today, we have experimental physicists and we have theoretical physicists. In the great monasteries, you had great theoretical Buddhists. And then in the monastery and outside, we had great contemplatives, some of them both, like Naropa, like Atisha, like Shantideva, great scholars and also profoundly accomplished contemplatives, siddhas, who manifested everywhere accepted in the Buddhist traditions, not only insight in nature of mind, but also drew forth the power of the mind, manifesting a wide range of modes of extrasensory perception, or abhijna in Sanskrit, heightened awareness, and also cities, powers that emerge from consciousness when it's empowered with samadhi and other sophisticated techniques. techniques. This is a thousand years of a university system, system that predated the establishment of the first university in the West, namely the University of Bologna. The university system in India largely died out for various reasons, including destruction by religious fanatics from the West, destroying Nalanda, destroying Vikramashila, destroying other universities. They were savages. Savages don't take kindly to civilization. This is a thousand years of university. And the West just generally assumes if they know anything about it at all, they discovered, discovered nothing significant about the nature of the mind. That may be something of mm, a projection. We turn now to technology. Among the wide array, dozens, scores of different meditations that the Buddha taught during the 45 years of his teaching, turning Wheel of Dharma, the one method he taught more frequently than any other, that he was practicing on the night of his enlightenment, that he was practicing on the day of his parinirvana, his final passing away, was mindfulness of breathing. And he comments, what happens when you practice this diligently, professionally? And he does so by way of an analogy. He states here, just as in the last month of the hot season, that would be late May, early June, before the monsoon strike. Just as in the last month of the hot season, when a mass of dust and dirt has swirled up, a great rain cloud out of season disperses it and quells it on the spot. So too, samadhi by mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, when you engage in this as a professional training, not just 20 minutes a day or an hour or two a day, that's a serious hobby. But in India, there have been professional contemplatives for thousands of years, in Buddhism, no exception, who will engage in this practice 10, 12, 14 hours a day for month after month. I've known I'd live with yogis who've been in full-time training for 25, 35 years. These are professional contemplatives. This tradition has been in Buddhism ever since the time of the Buddha. This mindfulness of breathing, this samadhi, this unification of attention by mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, is peaceful, sublime, an ambrosial dwelling, and it disperses and quells on the spot unwholesome or non-virtuous states whenever they arise. 
gives the analogy of the swiftness with which the mind is clarified, like a rain, a, a, a cloudburst when the air is so, so dirty with contamination. It leads to a state that is peaceful. One would expect that. You're calming the mind, calming the turbulence of conceptualization. And to say that is sublime, I would interpret this as sukha, satsukha, a sense of genuine well-being. It's not stimulus-driven. You're not receiving pleasant stimuli. And then finally, an ambrosial dwelling, I, I would interpret this as pritti, joy. Joy, bliss arises from the very nature of your awareness when your mind is well-tuned. It's a symptom of a mind that is healthy. So you don't need to look outside yourself for bliss. Refine your mind, focusing on a neutral object, the breathing. And a sense of well-being and bliss arises from the very nature of your own awareness. And the final point is this has ethical significance. And that is when unwholesome states like malevolence, jealousy, arrogance, cruelty, resentment, when they, these may arise, you've not expunged them from your mind stream yet. They arise, but they gain no footing. They're like a parasite looking for a host, but your mind is too healthy. Your psychological immune system is too refined. They may come to infect you, but they get no footing. And this samadhi disperses and quells them on the spot. This points to one of the greatest discoveries in the, in the Buddhist tradition, and I'm confident it was discovered before the Buddha came. Be it, but he articulated it as such in the Pali Canon. He writes very famously, this is quoted many times, I know of no other single process which thus developed and cultivated, again, the professionalism, not taking this as a hobby, no other single process which as, is as pliable and serviceable as is this mind. Amongst the mind which is thus developed and cultivated is pliable and serviceable. Monks, I know of no other single process so quick to change as is this mind. Monks, this mind is luminous, but it is obscured by adventitious defilements. Monks, this mind is luminous, but it is free from adventitious defilements. He's speaking about the nature of consciousness when it's not obscured by the mental afflictions, by dullness, by agitation, by the five obscurations of hedonic fixation, ill will, excitation and anxiety, laxity and dullness, afflictive uncertainty. When the mind is unveiled from these obscurations, its pure and luminous nature shines forth, but it's always there. It's there when it is obscured, by such things as these five obscurations. And it's there and then revealed when these adventitious coming and going defilements are absent. This is tremendous discovery. And it's been replicated countless times by Buddhists in all traditions, Theravada, Indian Buddhism, Chan, Zen, Tibetan Buddhism. The mind is naturally pure, but adventitiously obscured. And then a little known point, but I think of tremendous significance is the references by the Buddha to the sign of the mind, citta samnimitta, the sign of the mind. And the Buddha comments here, if one cultivates the four applications of mindfulness, the very paradigm of Buddhist contemplative science, by which one investigates with the union of shamatha and vipassana, the nature of the body and all physical phenomena, the nature of feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral in myself and others, the nature of the mind and its processes, and the nature of phenomena at large by means of four, clo four close, sophisticated applications of mindfulness. If one cultivates the four applications of mindfulness, that is, fully ventures into Vipassana, without the mind being concentrated, without having developed samadhi, and without having abandoned the impurities, like the five obscurations. If one does so, you may practice Vipassana for years and years and years, but one does not acquire one's own mental sign. Jittasa nimitta, 
don't acquire it. What is this sign of the mind? I can't elaborate now, time is short. But I can say with great confidence, when the Buddha is referring to the sign of the mind, he's referring to that from which the mind actually emerges at conception, for example, or during the process of gestation. That from which your mind emerges when you come from deep dreamless sleep. That dimension of consciousness, which is by nature pure, he's already referred to it. That dimension of consciousness into, into which your human mind dissolves at death, it doesn't become nothing. There's a conservation of consciousness in the natural world every bit as much as is a consciousness of matter and energy, but the physicist knows so well. The Buddha comments in the same vein, in the same context. In this manner, monks, the wise, experienced, skillful monk abides in happiness, genuine well-being here and now, and is mindful, sati, and introspective, sampajanya, as well. And what is the reason for this? Because monks, this wise, experienced, skillful monk, acquires the sign of his own mind. He knows the nature of consciousness in this primal flow, which is by nature luminous, that does not begin at conception, does not end at death. It is that from which the mind emerges and into which it dissolves every time you fall deep asleep. The nature of consciousness is not a mystery in Buddhism. It's not been a mystery since the time of the Buddha. Insights, discoveries pertaining to the actual nature of consciousness have been replicated countless times by monks and all, monks, nuns, yogis, in all traditions of Buddhism. That which is a great mystery to this day, because of the straitjacket of physicalism, has been completely made manifest in the Buddhist tradition countless times because they found the right technology. Then we turn to Vipassana. Now, this is vast, a vast array of methods of inquiry. It's not just being mindful that you need for shamatha, and it's not just bare attention that doesn't even rise to the level of being shamatha. Vipassana by nature in all schools of Buddhism entails inquiry. It is contemplative science. It's not just passively witnessing whatever's coming up. So among the four applications of mindfulness, I highlight just one and I have to be brief. The Buddha's quintessential instruction. And how monks does one abide reviewing the mind as the mind? It's an uncommon translation, it's my translation, and I stick by it. Reviewing means exactly that. The Sanskrit, Pali, Tibetan, are you reviewing? You're taking a fresh look at that with which you're very familiar, but you're seeing it as it were for the first time. And you're seeing the mind as the mind not as mine, not as me, not as my personality. The mind as the mind, you're seeing the mind as a natural phenomenon and you're exploring it as such. Just what William James was calling for. Treat the mind as a natural phenomenon and investigate it as such. We've not done that for the last hundred years in the mind sciences. Too caught up in the constraints of physicalism. Study the behavior, interview people who have minds, study their brains, but no sophisticated methods for observing the mind, reviewing the mind as the mind. And I'll just read through some of the core inquiry that one applies. Here one knows an attached mind to be attached and a mind without attachment to be unattached. One knows a hostile mind to be hostile. You're a scientist of these different modes of mentation or mental activity, recognizing the afflictive and the unflictive. One knows a mind without hostility to be unhostile. One knows a deluded mind to be deluded and a mind without delusion to be undeluded. One knows a contracted mind to be contracted and a distracted mind to be distracted. One knows a great mind to be great and a small mind to be small. And one knows a surpassable mind to be surpassable and an unsurpassable mind to be unsurpassable. He's charting now the progress in insights and discoveries along the path to liberation. And one knows a concentrated mind to be concentrated and an unconcentrated mind to be unconcentrated. One knows a liberated mind to be liberated and an unliberated mind to be unliberated. You're fathoming, exploring through direct experience, 
the nature, the permutations, the constraints, and the freedom of constraints of this natural phenomenon called the mind. This is core contemplative science of the mind. And now a refrain that goes for all of the four applications of mindfulness. In this one, and in this way, one abides reviewing the mind as the mind internally, that is your own mind, externally, indirectly observing the minds of others by way of their behavior, speaking, and so forth, internally and externally, examining the interface of the activities of your own mind and those of others. One abides reviewing the nature of arising. How does the mind arise from moment to moment? Of passing away from moment to moment of both arising and passing away of the mind as the mind. Mindfulness that there is a mind is established in one to the extent necessary for knowledge and continuous mindfulness and one abides independently, not clinging to anything in the world. So no addiction to hedonia, directly cultivating eudaimonia, genuine well-being by knowing the nature of the mind. And that is how one abides review, review, reviewing the mind as the mind. We turn now to a classic shamatha technique in the Dzogchen tradition. And I must read it quickly, our time is running out. By settling the mind in its natural state, sensations of bliss may arise, such as physical, pleasant physical and mental sensations, experiences of luminosity, such as a clarity of consciousness, experiences of non-conceptuality, such as the appearance of empty forms, as well as a non-conceptual sense that nothing can harm your mind, regardless of whether or not thoughts have ceased. With shamat alone, you become lucid with respect to your mind in the waking state. Whatever kinds of experiences and visions arise, be they gentle or violent, subtle or gross, of long or short duration, strong or weak, good or bad, observe their nature and avoid any obsessive evaluation of them as being one thing and not another. Let the heart of your practice be consciousness, naturally at rest, lucid and clear. Discovery of the separate consciousness. I alluded to it earlier. It's called the Bhavanga in the Theravada tradition. Time is running out. I must wrap up quickly here, but you'll have the, the slides after I finish speaking. This substrate consciousness called in Sanskrit, the Alaya Vijnana, to me, it's perfectly clear. It's a discovery made within the Mahayana tradition, and it's pointing to the same dimension of consciousness, now called the Alaya Vijnana, from which the mind emerges, into which it dissolves when you fall asleep, when you die, which manifests when you achieve shamatha. It illuminates all appearances. Without the separate consciousness, there wouldn't be any appearances. And yet it does not merge with them. The actual nature of the consciousness as taught by Nagarjuna is that although it appears to move from lifetime to lifetime, the substrate consciousness that bears all of our memories, our habitual densities, it appears to move from here to there, from one life to the next. But in, in reality, it's empty of inherent nature. It does not exist by its own intrinsic identity. The actual nature of phenomena, the Buddha gives the example of a chariot that does not exist by its own objective inherent nature. This is in the Pali Canon, but is a, simply a matter of naming the conceptual designation. This theme we find seminally in the Pali Canon, much more elaborately in the Mahayana, the perfection of wisdom, where all conditioned phenomena are said to exist independent upon prior causal conditions. Science explores that. Their own constituent parts and attributes, the mariological sums, independence upon which the conditions, quality, independence upon which the whole exists, and crucially, the conceptual designation of them. I think I'll end here on this note, the actual nature of the mind. One may conclude that, oh, the external world doesn't really exist out there, but certainly the mind to which all appearances manifest without which there are no appearances, the mind must inherently exist. It must be inherently real. So say those who follow the Chittamatra or mind only view in Buddhism, but this too is refuted in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. I'll read this quote and I'll end. From the Ratnachuta Sutra, we consider this while thoroughly experiencing the mind. What are those minds that become attached or hateful or deluded? Do they arise in the past, future or present? Any mind that is past is vanished. Whatever is in the future has not, has not yet come. Whatever arises in the present does not last. You can't pin it down. 
You can't find that mind as it exists in and of itself. This mind is not found to be present inside, in your body, outside, or with inside and outside. The mind is formless, undemonstrable, intangible, devoid of a basis, invisible, unknowable, and without any location. The mind has never been, ever been seen, is not seen, will never be seen by any of Buddhas as a phenomenon existing in and of itself. The objective world is empty of inherent nature. The subjective mind is empty of inherent nature. The role of mind in nature is absolutely fundamental. Kashyapa, even though one looks at the mind everywhere, it is not to be found. Whatever is unfindable is unobservable. Whatever is unobservable that does not arise in the past or in the future or in the present. It does not intrinsically come into being or pass from being. Whatever does not arise in the past or in the future or in the present really transcends the three times. Whatever really transcends the three times is neither existent nor non-existent. It transcends and is empty of all conceptual categories. And to fathom that, to cut through the conditioned mind, is to fathom a dimension of consciousness that is truly transcendent. And this is the explicit theme of some of the great traditions of inter-Tibetan Buddhism, such as Mahamudra and Dzogchen, which have method for fathoming primordial consciousness that transcends all conceptual categories, transcends it three times. It is the mind of the Buddha, the wellspring of genuine well-being, and the source, the very ground of the whole of reality. So on this, my time has run out and I'm afraid it went a little bit too long. But such as my enthusiasm is unbridled. I hope this has been helpful. This is what I can offer for now. Thank you for this opportunity to share.